Greetings and welcome back to my Let's Play of Orbiter. Um, we are starting uh, some scenarios with the Shuttle A. Um, the Shuttle A is this little craft right here. It carries cargo and has fuel and a little cabin and a docking port and little legs and some engines. Um, well, you can see it. So what we're going to be doing, I'm actually going to check to see if we have Mir, which we do. Um, so anyway, nope, I didn't mean to close that. <laughs> Sorry about that. We are going to be taking off in this from Earth, which is uh, very difficult to do. This is meant to be a orbital or lunar transport thing. Um, no air. As you can see, it's not very aerodynamic. So it's very difficult to get into orbit, so I'm going to get into orbit and try to dock with Mir. That is my eventual goal. Um, apparently we're supposed to be docking with the ISS in this scenario, but screw that. When have I ever followed any kind of rules? So, let's... Nope, I didn't want that. I want to track and zoom in. Um, let's display orbit plane. Um, so unlike at Cape Canaveral, uh, we're a bit lower here at Habana. So, the ecliptical plane does pass over us. Um, it appears to be just above 90 degrees, which I am going to assume is around, uh, I don't know, what do you say that is? 80 degrees? I'm going to do 80 degrees. Which is almost where we're facing anyway. I keep wanting to close this. Um, so, here is the shuttle. Um, if you go up, you see the... Uh, can I get rid of that? Um, I guess that's better. You can see the oh, cargo panel, which you can open and close the airlock, or um, deploy or retract the gear, or arm the payload and drop it. But we don't want to drop it, because we want to take all our stuff into space, and possibly to the moon. And that's all the panels you get. Um, here we have three types of engines, main, hover, which you have like on the delta glider, and these auxiliary engines, which are these ones sticking out to the side. Um, hover engines are not actually powerful enough to get us off the ground. So the auxiliary engines, we can point them forward. I slowed down too much, didn't I? So you can point them so they're facing forward. In other words, the engine is pointing backwards, which means when they fire, they accelerate you forward. Um, you can face them um, in reverse, which is the opposite, or you can face them in hover. Or anywhere in between. But we want hover for now. Um, they do take up fuel. Um, fuel is indicated here. You have two main fuel tanks, one internal tank, or two external tanks, which are these giant things here, and one internal tank, which is about half of a single external tank, and an RCS tank, which is much, much less than everything put together. And you can see that the external tanks feed into both hover and main and um, auxiliary. So whatever you use, it all comes out of these tanks. Um, but you will see that in a bit. So I want to bring this HUD back. Um, there's no cool little shortcut key for these auxiliary pods. So I'm just going to do that, and hover engines to maximum, and you can see we're barely taking off the ground, and we are doing normal time compression. So let's raise our landing gears, um, turn using the RCS system, you can see our fuel is going down to 80 degrees, thereabouts. And then I'm going to do full power on the main engines to move forward and tilt ourselves upward. And as I tilt ourselves upward, I am going to tilt the auxiliary pods to about 30 degrees to compensate for um, being tilting upward by 60 degrees. I'm going to turn down the volume. Um, 
So there's that. And now you may notice that the hover engines are kind of working against us. And so uh, right now they're really only controlling our vertical velocity. So as our um, this is what direction you're going indicator, <laughs> prograde grid indicator, gets closer, I'm going to turn down the hover engines because that's just wasting fuel. But as you can see, we are using a lot of fuel very quickly. I need to turn you to orbit. Projection. Distance. There we go. So here we are, taking off. Uh, we've just broken the sound barrier. I'm going to tilt my way upward. Um, a note on this rotation. The left button... Oh, you can rotate these individually. I tend not to. So just try to aim for the middle. The left number indicates what target you want. The right indicates what degree they are actually set to. Um, so that's just for future reference. Um, I am going to tilt down to... Uh, uh, 40 degrees, and move this to... I can't do math. 50? I think 50 is what I want. There we go. So I can probably take those out entirely. Um, cutting off the hover engines, I don't think I need them anymore. Um, just reducing fuel consumption. Um, we are going to barely get into orbit, by the way. Um, probably won't have enough fuel to actually dock with anything. Our uh, apoapsis... I'm going to try... I, I learned... Um, I'm actually going to put these entirely forward. I learned the difference between apoapsis and apo apogee. And perigee and periapsis. So I'm going to try to use the... Um, proper terms. I'm doing. I'm putting all my engines forward to try to increase our um, horizontal velocity because I said in the moon video, horizontal velocity is all you need, well, except on Earth where you kind of need a little bit of altitude to get over the air. Anyway, um, while I'm waiting to get into orbit, I will talk about apoapsis and periapsis. Um, apoapsis and periapsis apoapsis being the highest point in an orbit and periapsis being the lowest point in an orbit are the generic general terms for it. Um, they refer to just any old orbit around any old body. Um, that's it. Apoapsis and periapsis. Apogee and perigee are in particular the orbits around Earth. Hence geos. Um, so if you are, say, orbiting around the moon your apogee and your perigee would be very, very, very similar to the moon's apogee and perigee because, you know, however you're orbiting around the moon, um, the moon is still orbiting around the Earth, and the distance that you're orbiting the moon is going to be much, 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 much um, too small to really matter in the grand scheme of things because the moon is really far away. Um, so, for that, I think they use... Selenia for the moon. Um, I'll have to look into that a little bit more to see what they know or what they call um, orbiting the moon. Um, you notice my vertical speed is getting to um, a bit low, so I'm going to put these back to hover to see if I can't uh, raise. I'm going to actually go entirely forward now. So I'm going to do um, H level. Um, so anyway, sorry if I got those wrong, which I know I got them wrong in various other videos. I'm a bit too low. As you can see, I'm still producing visible exhaust, which is not a good thing. But I'm also not nearly close to orbit yet. So I have time to raise uh, my app G, which make sense in this scenario because I'm around the Earth right now. Anyway, I know for the Sun it's aphelion and perihelion, so that's what the Earth has is aphelion and perihelion. Um, again, the Sun being helios. Um, interestingly, although we've used Roman names for the planets, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, etc., um, 
the names for the um, apoapsis and periapsis, I think, are the Greek ones. So you have um, like Hermes and Aphrodite and um, Geos, Ares, etc. Which I, I find is cool because I always loved the Greek names much better than the Roman names. Um, so that's Apihelion and Perihelion. Um, I'll probably end up just using, or not Apihelion, I'll probably just end up using um, Apoapsis and Periapsis. It sounds cooler anyway. So uh, that is that for now. Um, we still have a bunch of orbit to get into. <laughs> you can see we're very, very low. Um, this is not a stable orbit at all, by the way, 77 kilometers, which is I'm trying to raise it. So you may notice when I hit the forward, it goes to zero, zero, and then this slowly moves as it rotates. Uh, how much fuel do we have left? We do not have much fuel left. Um, one thing I forgot to talk about is why, or during the, um, can't think and concentrate at the same time, is why one would need a cooling system on a spaceship. Because space is cold. Um, I believe it's around 3 Kelvin, which is ridiculously cold. So why would you need cooling systems on a spaceship if space is so cold? And the answer to that is actually fairly simple. It's because um, there's nothing to take away your heat. So if you ever subscribe to Vsauce or anything like that, or um, maybe not Vsauce, it's Veritasium, he did a video about the temperature of a book and a hard drive. Um, books will tend to feel warmer than hard drives, even if they've both been sitting in the same room, because hard drives, or metal, conducts heat a lot faster which is why they feel colder, because room temperature, um, about 21 degrees, is colder than body temperature, which is about 31 degrees or 35 degrees. I'm not up to brush on my Celsius, sorry. And so when you touch, say, a wooden something, which wood is a poorer conductor of heat, it doesn't suck heat away from your body as quickly as when you touch metal, which is why metal feels colder. Um, so in space, space is a terrible conductor of heat. That's why you, they have vacuum sealed thermoses. Because there's nothing to conduct heat away from you. And so while space itself is cold, um, radioact or not radioactively, radiationally. Um, anyway, while space is cold in the. Um, electromagnetic radiation form, there's nothing to actually take heat away from you. So the only way to get heat away passively would be to radiate it in the form of electromagnetic, or electromagnetic radiation, which we humans would be um, in the infrared. And that's a notoriously terrible way to um, whisk heat away. It's slow, and um, you can't really rely on it to um, make much of a difference. I'm actually going to switch this to surface so I can more easily round out my orbit. Um, and so you need some way to cool your spaceship because any process you use to provide life support or power will end up producing heat and if not managed properly you could very easily overheat in space. Um, one of the ways they do that is by ammonia boiling which boiling cools down the liquid that is being boiled. So you can do something like that, have some amount of coolant with you, and boil it away into space, because liquids will boil extremely well in space due to the lack of... I need to... hang on. I'm going to turn down my auxiliary pods. I don't need them. Um, anyway, liquids boil extremely well in space because there's no air pressure to keep them from not boiling. Uh, 113 kilometers is decent. <laughs> I don't. I'm 
don't think well, we're above the official boundary of space, but as you can see, our dynamic pressure is still in the hundreds of pascals. Anyway, so you can boil something like ammonia into space, um, thus cooling it down, and then you can use this really cold liquid to um, cycle around your ship and take heat that way, and then boil it off into space. But obviously the downsides to that is you need something, you need like a canister of ammonia to use. So cooling systems are um, pretty important in uh, spaceships. I'm not sure what the International Space Station uses. Maybe they just radiate away because um, they have enough surface area to do something like that. Because that's really it all. If you take like a really good conductor of heat and just have giant flat sheets of it, um, it'll radiate, obviously, into space with whatever electromagnetic radiation wavelength it particularly radiates um, at whatever temperature. Um, the higher the temperature, the shorter the wavelength, which is why if you get it up to around 700 Celsius, it starts glowing red because it finally gets in the visible spectrum. And we humans only radiate in the infrared. Anyway, I'm getting way off topic. Was I really on a topic? Did I have a topic for this video? Maybe I should have been talking about how I was doing this. <laughs> um, how I was getting into orbit with this thing. As you can see, we've used up most of our fuel. Um, so what I did is basically just how you get into orbit with anything from Earth. Um, you gain a lot of altitude to get out of the atmosphere, and then you gain a lot of horizontal speed to get into orbit. That's basically the two-step process. Um, don't try to use Lola. You can use Lola to get into an orbit and even dock with something. That could be my next video. is an extremely boring, um, time-compressed ten times video of Lola doing it for me. <laughs> Um, but don't use Lola on Earth. The atmosphere messes everything up. Uh, so let's see. Cleared up apoapsis and periapsis. Talked about why you need coolant. Um, summarized getting into orbit, I guess? Yeah. I don't know. Huh. I guess I could time compress while I'm waiting. Time compression is your friend. Let's go prograde. Um, so let's round out our orbit. And then once I've done that, I will end this video here and maybe continue in the next one. Um, just like with putting, um, not Grecker, or Gecker. I was misreading his name. Um, who's the guy we put into orbit around the moon? Gosh. Anyway, the guy we put into orbit around the moon. Um, just like I said with him, that was my first. That was my first time doing that. Um, this is my first time actually trying to get into an ecliptical paint plane with the. I think that's now at nighttime. Um, so I'm not sure if I want to actually try to get to the moon. Um, obviously we'd have to refuel first, because this is not enough fuel to get to the moon. So, I don't know what I'm going to do. But just in case, I'm going to quick save this. And then I will see you in the next video. So, see you then.